Hello and welcome to episode 117 of the Mark and Me podcast. As always, I'm your host Mark. Joining me on today's episode is the artist Matt Griffin. In my opinion, one of my favourite artists out there and easily one of the best in the country. You'll know his work as soon as you check out his Instagram, Facebook or Twitter, Bottleneck Gallery or Vice Press. Some of the designs that he's done blow my mind. Just go and look at his Dune or his Alien poster and honestly, you'll be lost thinking this is incredible and you'll end up going out there and spending loads of money and filling your house with loads and loads of framed artwork. Because if you're anything like me, you'll get this big passion for it and just want to invest. This is part of my Voice Behind the Art special and it's a real big way of changing the podcast because I was doing a lot of musicians, film directors, actors, but this gave me a whole new way of thinking, a whole new way of getting different types of guests, a whole new perspective and a whole new range of interviews and it's been one of the best things to happen to Mark and me and I'm absolutely thrilled that Matt's joining me for today's episode. But in true typical Mark and Me fashion, I like to talk about the last episode. So I was joined by Juan and Paco from the absolutely amazing film Wreck. Those directors were great and the response was amazing. But the episode has only been out a few days because things are really full on at the moment. And I'm trying to get as many episodes out as I can to you guys out there. So what I want to do now is get straight to today's episode. As I said, it's the next part of the Voice Behind the Arts special and it's Matt Griffin. So here's me and Matt talking all things art. So Matt, thanks for joining me today on the Mark and Me podcast. Yeah, very nice to be here. Thanks for having me. What I want to do is basically take it right back to the start. So if there's people that are listening today that haven't discovered you yet as an artist, um, what was it that kind of made you fall in love with art? Was it a, a really young age at school? Yeah, so I'd say like pretty much everybody in my profession there, uh, I've always drawn for as long as I can remember. Um, I think I could, I was drawing before I could walk or do anything else. Um, I can't remember a time or a day when I wasn't drawing. Um, when we used to have family uh, gatherings at Christmas and stuff like that, I used to go out to the car with a notebook and pen and just draw because I, I didn't, I wasn't very social <laughs> at that age and I just wanted to draw. So that was it, I was just obsessed with it. Um, and uh, it was kind of much later in life. Uh, I started on a professional path in my, uh, towards the end of my 20s. So I came to that side of it late. But as for making art, it's been a, a constant uh, thing in my life. So when you're at this young age and you're there drawing all the time and literally spending any spare time you have drawing, was there, I suppose, at a very young age, you're not really aware of all the other artists out there. You just look at pictures, don't you? And you fall in love with them. But was there a certain style that you were loving or movie posters or certain themes that you were really kind of getting inspired by? Yeah, there was, there was actually lots. Um, so uh, I was a young kid in the 80s. So the movie poster art and VHS cover art of the 80s was massive. Yeah. I had three older, three older brothers, so access to uh, 18s films or R-rated films, as they're called in some countries, was uh, not a problem. And so uh, going to the video store to rent a film and look, you always judged a, a video by its cover back in yep. those days. Um, that was a big, a big thing for me. Um, and actually only later in, in recent years, I've realized what a huge influence that was. Um, I was also an avid reader from a young age and the uh, covers on books as a kid played a massive part. So anything from the C.S. Lewis, uh, Narnia covers, um, Quentin Blake covers on Roald Dahl. And the one I think that hit most in terms of both cover and illustrations inside was The Hobbit and Tolkien's illustrations there. Amazing. And so I was quite young, I think, when I read The Hobbit and it made a gigantic impact. And I kind of decided there and then that someday I wanted to not only draw for this kind of story but to create my own uh, story my own world and draw the pictures in it which I got to do then uh, five years ago and then you were saying just then as well it was later on it was kind of when you were in your early 20s that it was really taken off what were you doing after college and school and stuff as a job what were you kind of getting into that thought well this might actually not be a profession so I'll do this instead yeah well uh, Making the jump to being a full-time illustrator was my late 20s. I was 28. Uh, so what happened was 
Um, in school, uh, there wasn't a huge amount I was good at apart from art and English. So I could write and I could draw and I was a total messer and the bane of every teacher's life in school. Um, but I think I got away with an awful lot because I could draw well. Um, and uh, I think me and everybody assumed that some form of art career was lying ahead for me. And then I uh, did quite badly in my uh, final exams, the leaving search. And uh, I didn't get into any courses. I ended up um, studying for a year doing philosophy and psychology, uh, which I didn't take to as, as well as I thought I would. Um, I kind of rebelled against the whole art thing, thinking, you know, this is what everybody expects of me, so I'm just not going to do it like an Egypt. Uh, you know, <laughs> this kind of young rebellious streak that does you absolutely no favors whatsoever. Um, and so I, I ended up working in, um, like at that stage, uh, news agents for a while because I, I dropped out of college and then decided, uh, okay, I'm going to go for this art college thing. And I basically had two months to apply um, for this course, Fine Art in Dunleary, which would be a very uh, well-known art college in Ireland. And normally this would be a year's work. So I fit it all into two months and I worked for 16 hours a day to get this portfolio and I got into the course. But unfortunately, uh, I was still a messer and I uh, didn't take it seriously enough. And then on the other hand, I don't think I was ever really a fine artist. I didn't take to the this kind of thing of anything can be art, but that's not art. Well, why? You said anything can be. You know, I don't think they really liked graphic styles or comic styles. Uh, we didn't hit it off um, and I didn't do myself any favors. So they, they offered uh, for me to repeat the year and I was actually going to be the first person ever to be offered an automatic place to repeat. Uh, you know, normally you'd have to reapply. And I said, no, thanks a million. And I went off to Australia and I worked on building sites and uh, as a, a brickies laborer and uh, had some adventures like that and by hook or by crook I ended up in London where I had a brother living and I worked in bars um, and I worked as uh, in various uh, different jobs and that brother was working with Sky at the time and he got me a week's work in Sky Sports and that uh, long story short that week turned into five years where wow. I worked in sport um, it was at that stage, though, working in sport, that I really was getting into design, graphics, and illustration, um, and using learning Photoshop and Illustrator. And so uh, I kind of moonlit for a long time. <clears throat> what I'd do is I would sneak off and go to Sky's creative department. And uh, they were really welcoming, and they would take me into their department, and they'd set me projects uh, you know, designing idents for TV channels and storyboarding stuff. Uh, they really took me under their wing and they didn't seem to mind that I was absconding from my actual job over in sport. And uh, I just got away with it for a while. Um, our boss was not present in the room uh, with us uh, over in sport. So I would just sneak off and do this. Uh, and uh, at the time, it's, it, it comes in, this comes into it later, but I wasn't getting on well with my boss in sport. Uh, surprise, surprise, uh, given I wasn't that dedicated to the job. And uh, the creative guys offered me a job there, but it was on a very, very low pay kind of apprenticeship pay, which yeah. I couldn't do. Um, you know, I was living on my own, paying rent, all that kind of stuff. And my boss, who I wasn't getting along with, had left and started up a new company creating content for Channel 4 Music. And he knew that music was a, another passion of mine and he hired me for this company. Nice. So uh, I'll, I'll try and cut the story in half because it can go on and on for hours. But essentially I ended up having a kind of a career in the media for seven years in London. But all the while getting a, a bigger and bigger itch to be more creative and to be drawing from my job. And in my job at Channel 4 Music, I was spending way too much time designing graphics and stuff for the websites instead of doing the actual work. Uh, my boss kind of accommodated it as much as he could. I designed t-shirts. He, he ran this blog called Holy Moly. I don't know if you ever remember that from the noughties. Yeah. Like, it was like a big celebrity yeah. gossip. 
celebrity gossip site. Yeah. So I, I, he had me doing illustrations for that. I, I did this series of um, Pete Doherty and Amy Winehouse that got quite popular. So I was doing more and more drawing, but it just wasn't my job uh, in my actual job description. And then that brought me to 2008. And uh, I had been talking to people back home in Ireland, ad companies and stuff about, should I make the leap and could I make it as, a, as an illustrator? And at the time, I thought to be an illustrator, you had to be either a storyboard artist or a political cartoonist or a caricaturist. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't understand the breadth of illustration styles you could do uh, in a professional career. So I thought I'll move home and I will be a storyboard artist for advertising and that'll be great. So I did. I quit my job in the media. I packed up my stuff. I came back home and the global recession hit like that month. <laughs> And all the promises of work disappeared and I was left uh, uh, with nothing, twiddling my thumbs. And that was it. I just went, okay, it's sink or swim now. And I haven't looked back since 2008. That's incredible. I mean, it's a big risk. And uh, were your family supportive? I mean, it's a thing where you think to yourself, you turn around to your parents and say, I'm going to go and do this full time. A lot of them are like, you need a real job, son. Oh, no, they were unbelievable. That was the yeah. thing. They, they just... Um, you know, I'm sure they, being a parent myself now, I'm sure I can understand that they would have loved if I just did something steady and got myself a degree instead of dropping out of two colleges after a year. And, uh, you know, they, I'm sure they would have liked that, but they were so supportive. Like they just said, we have every faith in your, that you'll find your way. You're just not someone who's going to be told how to do things and you'll get there eventually. I'm very much someone who, infuriatingly who wants to do things my own way i can't be taught anything no. uh, my wife now is a teacher and she can't abide that personality trait <laughs> in me uh i just have to figure stuff out for myself even if it takes longer um and yeah so my family were super supportive and i'm sure i had you know had them pulling their hair out over the years but they just said you're grand you'll get there eventually and uh, thankfully uh, with a lot of elbow grease in fairness uh, i did so can you remember, like you said, it's 2008. So can you remember when you had this kind of thought process of, right, I'm going to do this, sink or swim. Can you remember those first sort of pieces of work that were then probably giving you the self-confidence that you'd made the right kind of decision? Yeah, like at that time, the art I was showing to advertisers back home uh, in order to try and drum up interest in my work was stuff I had done for that Sky Department. It was a yeah. lot of storyboards, ideas for TV items, you know, and I'd done Cartoon Network projects as in not real ones. These were kind of fake projects that the department had set me to kind of, you know, give me something to do. Uh, so I had ideas for Cartoon Network, TV items and Sky One and all these various things. So I was showing that kind of stuff and it, it was okay. Um, but my, my collection of work at that stage was really awful. You know, it wasn't good. Um, uh, it maybe showed some promise. Yeah. And I think those advertisers probably said, this guy has some potential. You know, maybe they thought we can get him for half price. I don't know. But uh, they must have seen something. But, you know, it wasn't great. Uh, I came back and there's, there was um, an organization in Ireland called Illustrators Ireland that was... Uh, a kind of a professional body that uh, only uh, accepted the best um, in the country. Right. And I applied to that and they declined my application, but very helpfully gave me feedback from the, the panel who had, <coughs> excuse me, who had judged the work and very detailed feedback on what was good, what was promising and what was bad in my work. And it really helped me focus on what I needed to do to start generating some some interest in it um you know it was all over the shop it was one image was cartoony another image was serious you know there was no um voice in the work it was all over the place so um i, I don't know if i answered your question what was the moment or the thoughts when i decided to go for it was well i was getting encouragement from back home that yeah. i could make something of it and I was sick of my job, but like, it was such a cool job. I have always dreamed of being a music journalist and I was doing it. I was the guy in the back of the gig with the notepad. Uh, I looked after unsigned bands. My, I was going to all the festivals. I went to gigs seven days a week. I interviewed 
all kinds of rock stars and pop stars. I was at all the award shows. It was an amazing job, but it, it wasn't what I wanted to do. It wasn't me expressing no. the ideas I have in my head. So I just said, it's now or never, it's stick or twist, you know, fuck it, go for it. Um, and that was what I did. And you then said you started looking at your work and you're looking at your portfolio and there wasn't kind of consistency. There was kind of a lot of different styles and different pieces. Yeah. Now, obviously, over 10 years later, you've definitely got your own style. You're in that category where if I see a bottleneck gallery promotion without even reading, I just see the image. I'm like, oh, that's one of Matt's. You know, it's, it's, huh. that's for me one of the best compliments you can give an artist, I think, is when you get to the point where I had Dan Mumford on recently and I said, look, when, as soon as you, I saw, there was an album or a, a piece of work he did, and I said, as soon as I saw it, I knew it was yours. And he's like, well, that's what I've always wanted to achieve. And, yeah. you know, for you, you've had the Alien artwork, you've had Back to the Future, uh, Dune recently, which, you know, sold like, uh, I blinked and it sold out. It was absolutely <laughs> insane. But all of them have got consistency. You must be at the point now where you're happy and you're believing that all the work you do is to a standard that makes your seal of approval kind of worthwhile yeah um and that is a huge compliment and thanks for that um yeah there's definitely this question of style has always gone on uh in the illust in the commercial art world you know um you know a lot of artists would say i don't like sticking to one particular style but it's not about drawing the same way over and over again it's about having something distinctive about what you produce that's you yeah and i think that comes from you get to a point where it's not like um it's not a trope it's not if i put this texture in i just throw that in and everybody's going to know it's me it's just your own voice your own ideas kind of coming through in the work and it, it's as you get a bit older maybe and a bit more experience it just starts to become more cohesive and your body of work like you say gets recognizable and, and that is absolutely where you want to be where if someone sees something on the internet and they say, I think that could be Dan Mumford or no, with, with Dan's you're going, that's Dan Mumford. Yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely. Um, so, so say with me then that's if someone can say, I think that could be a Matt Griffin thing. And then yeah. they're right. Yeah. That's definitely where you want to be. I mean, and I have other styles, but I created a pseudonym for that. Uh, the pseudonym Ignatius Fitzpatrick, which is uh, a totally different body of work. It's, mid-century animation inspired stuff um but i couldn't have that with my regular stuff so you know you, you split off but yeah it, it took all the since 2008 12 years later i think to really get that uh down pat and you're happy at the moment i mean you're at the point now where you are working with these great places i always love places like vice press and bottleneck gallery i think it's where all my money goes but you know you, you're huh. looking at these releases and it's not you know it's within a few minutes on twitter your announcement of your doom posters up there and I, I think five minutes later it completely sold out the variants had sold out it must be a really good place to be to see these huge good perspective galleries promoting your work and then seeing the response just fly out it's an unbelievable feeling it really is like and it's quite a recent development in my career you know um I've only been working with Bottleneck now for, I think, just this year. My first release was this Iron Giant poster uh, at the beginning of the year. Um, and I've known, been friends with Matt Ferguson for longer than that. But it's only now, I've, you know, I, I did Silent Running was my first release with uh, Vice. Yeah. Um, like I had been hovering around the poster scene for a good few years. Uh, like a alternative poster, movie poster art was something I'd been doing for a good few years but mostly working with Arrow um, in producing DVD covers. Yeah. Um, and uh, I had done a piece with Hero Complex about eight years ago. I'd done a Gallery 1988 show. I was hovering around, um, you know, l hoping someday to work with the likes of Vice and Bottleneck. Um, it wasn't quite happening. And then uh, as I got uh, more and more friendly with Matt Ferguson, uh, I don't know, did he put a word in for me? But Bottleneck then just got in touch out of the blue and said, uh, we like your stuff. And since then, it's, it's just gone so well. And thankfully, because those few releases you mentioned have sold quickly, um, 
there, you know, I'm now in a position where, you know, license dependent, I can pick and choose what I'm going to do next uh, with, with those guys, you know, uh, James Henshaw of Vice said recently on another uh, podcast that whatever I wanted to do, if they could get the license or if they had the license, I can do it. And that's an amazing spot that's awesome. to be in. So yeah, it's, it's amazing. I, I actually can't quite believe it to be honest. And like I say, it's, it's recent. So I'm still um, processing it. Yeah, I think it's just, um, just over 12 months or maybe just slightly longer. I remember seeing the up poster you did. Yes. And, uh, again another really quick sell out and bottleneck and i thought wow like like you said three or four releases in that 12 month period just flown out and i've never seen anything like it with the june poster literally seconds and i thought you know like you said it must be the best feeling to i was thinking i wonder what it's like to be the artist because sam gilby had a design go up this week and i think it's one of the first times he's worked with bottleneck and i was thinking you panicking you thinking shit what happens if they don't sell any and you know they only sell yeah. seven copies in a week you know that's exactly what you're going through it's, it's <laughs> like uh my my wife actually doesn't like sale days because i am up to 90 i'm so nervous yeah um just thinking what if this is the one where i get the email from joe at bottleneck saying uh listen sorry man uh sometimes these things happen uh, yeah we'll, we'll leave them up for it for a few weeks to see if one or two more sell and then sorry it's you know you have all these fears going through your head. And I, and I have a Facebook group um, with a lot of collectors on there and they're brilliant and they're so supportive. It's become a lovely little uh, community for me. And uh, they laugh at me sometimes. They're like, oh, dude, you know, you have no idea. This is going to be gone really quickly. And I just, no, I refuse to believe it. This is the one that's going to be a disaster. And uh, thankfully so far, uh, it's gone well. You never know, though, you know, down the line, they can't all sell that quick. And what's it like? Um, obviously, you've talked about working with Arrow, who, again, they get loads of my money. I love their DVDs and Blu-rays and Steelbooks and all their artwork. You're working with Bottleneck, Vice. What do you want to do next? Do you want to be at the point where you're going to the cinema with your wife and you look up and there's one of your posters in the, the lobby? Or is there something that you'd like to see on Netflix with your artwork? Is there something that you kind of have got these goals to achieve? Um. Do you know what? There, there are goals about going to the cinema, but it's got nothing to do with, with the poster art or the key art for the film. It's, it's more about the actual film itself. So, yeah. Um, like, yeah, Arrow have been an unbelievable client. I'm actually working on what I think is my 95th piece of art for Arrow um, wow. over the course of the last few years. Um, that's including box sets and, and uh, outer sleeves. I'm including yeah. the individual pieces of art in that, but it's, I'm at 95. Um, I've done key art for uh, Studio Canal cinema releases. Um, I see my art up on Apple Movies all the time and not Netflix um, uh, thus far. So in that sense, it's not sitting on my laurels. I've, I've kind of achieved those things. Um, I'm loving the poster art scene uh, in a big way and I really want to continue doing that for as long as I possibly can. Um, but in terms of career um, prospects or hopes for the future, uh, I'm starting to get a little bit into film development and TV development because uh, I'm a writer too. I wrote three yeah. books and kind of through that, I've been introduced to people um, like I'm working with a film director, Lee Cronin, an Irish film director who did The Hole in the Ground, which is an amazing uh, Irish horror film. And he's now directing the new Evil Dead movie for Sam Raimi. Wow. Um, it's kind of on the development end of stuff. So it involves art too, because I can do that. I can do some concept art pieces for films. But because I would also have some um, storytelling abilities, I can also work a little bit on the story development side. And now I'm at the very, very start of that. I'm on the first rung of the ladder. But I'm very excited about that. And I think if I can combine that with making the art I love for galleries um, like Bottleneck and Vice, um, then I would be in a very, very good place. Um, uh, and the odd book cover for passion projects like Dune, I'm very happy to do. Um, but I mean, I guess what I'm hoping is to do a little less of the commercial work that, you know, I'm not that passionate about yeah. and doing it for a paycheck. Uh, and it looks like in 20, 2021, I should be in a position to just be making work that I, I'm really excited to make. And that's definitely a very, very good feeling, you know. 
and a question I've been asking all the artists that have been on the podcast, but I'm kind of intrigued. Do you ever just get time now just to sketch and draw and do stuff that isn't then going to be for a client? Do you ever find the time where you just get to sit back and just draw for yourself or is that completely gone now with the amount of workload you've got? Uh, no, because making personal art is so unbelievably important that yeah. um, actually what happens is I squeeze the client work into my personal work time and I'm sure there's clients listening going, what? But <laughs> it's so important to do the personal work. Now, it's not necessarily sketching. I have to admit I have lost touch with just sitting down and drawing on paper. Yeah, Nearly everything I'm doing is digital now because... I'm uh, learning new tech as well. You know, I've, I'm doing a lot more work in 3D. I'm learning how to animate in 3D. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm really throwing my hat in with the digital stuff um, more and more. But personal work has, has always gotten me where I am, you know, every step of the way. It's always a piece of personal work that a client highlights as I like this. Um, we'd like something like this, you know. It's opened every door excuse me, every door that's been open for me is on the back of work I've created for myself. And I think it's probably because of the, the passion I talked about shines through in it. You know, yeah. they can see that it's stuff that really excites you to make it. And so I will never stop doing that. And, and also I can't help it. I will sit down like on today and go, right, I have four client jobs I have to work on today. I'll just have this quick idea for something. I'll just quit. I'll do five minutes on it. The next thing you know, it's two hours later and I finished it and they're like going, oh, oh, you know, now I'm now I need to do the rest of my work. So I'll work into the evening and the night on the client work. Uh, but it's it has to be done. Personal work is number one. Definitely. So you're the first artist I've spoken to after five episodes that's actually found the time now and still does personal projects. Everyone else is just like, I physically can't. I just take the client piece of work do it move on to the next project get that done set myself a time and it's interesting to hear because you know i'm really glad that you still got that and you uh, keep in tight of it yeah i i just i've always found it, it it's beneficial to me yeah so i learned a long time ago that it's good business practice to put effort and time into my personal work because yeah. it leads to commercial work and i work fast and I work in a flurry of panic and pressure. Uh, and everything is, oh my God, I'm running behind on that. Um, but I, I've also learned that that's where I produce my best stuff. So I'm content with that now. So my process is work on my personal stuff because it'll, it makes commercial sense, plus it makes me happy, plus I get better at my craft. Then on the back of that, get commercial work. And okay, I put myself under extreme pressure juggling multitudinous commercial projects because I tend to have an awful lot of commercial projects on the go now at any one time, thankfully, uh, for which I'm very grateful. And they're always done in, under huge pressure, but that's where I create my best stuff. So it might give me a heart attack or put me in an early grave, but it's, it's working for me, so I, I keep it up. You know. And my final question, a lot of young up and coming artists listen to the podcast, especially with the artist specials. And I've asked every artist that's been on, but what advice do you give to people that right now, I think at the moment, movie posters are the most popular they've ever been. You know, you get variants, you get all these different galleries doing time releases. I've never seen a time when it's been so popular. I think on Twitter, Instagram, it's a really good chance for people to get their work seen. But what advice do you give to those people that want to become the next you or become the next Struzan or become the next Paul Shipper that really want to kind of get into this full time and help and hope that it becomes a career? Yeah, well, firstly, being put in the same sentence as Paul Shipper and Drew Struzan uh, is, uh, uh, can't be accurate. Uh, that's a crazy thing to say, but uh, those those guys are obviously um, in a different league and they're amazing. But what I would say to anybody is there is a path to making alternative poster art for galleries. And that path is making alternative posters for yourself and putting it out there. Now, you don't want to go selling this alternative poster art because it's unlicensed. 
and bootlegging work and I've done it in my early career selling now very limited prints of unlicensed work before I kind of knew what the deal was. It actually harms your chance of doing licensed work down the line. Um, some properties just won't, um, you know, they won't want to not necessarily work with you ever, but they certainly won't want to license artwork that's already been shared online or whatever. Yeah. But um, the fact is, if you, as a young artist, want to get into this, you just start making those posters and you put them out there and you share them online, not for sale. Uh, and uh, by making them, you will get better at your craft. Uh, by posting them online, not only will more eyeballs see them, but also you might get some feedback that's very helpful. Sometimes as an artistic person, hard to take. <laughs> like it has to be admitted. Sometimes when someone corrects your work, uh, you know, it can be hard to swallow, but it's always helpful and productive. And that's the way to do it. You just, you've, if you're passionate about it, you will want to do nothing else. It's like learning an instrument. If you play the guitar, if you love playing it, and it's a pleasure to do so. You'll practice all the time and you'll get really, really good at it. Whereas if it's a chore and you can't be arsed to pick it up and practice it, you won't get good at it. And it's the same with art. And it's the same with making posters. If that's where you want to be, you'll just make that work and put it out there. And don't be afraid to send it to the galleries uh, or to other poster artists you admire. If you're a massive Paul Shipper fan, now he might not be happy with me saying this, but I'm sure he gets a lot of artists sending their work to him. Yeah, and I don't. I get artists send in their work to me, and I'm always very happy to respond uh, when I can. You know, look for feedback and help, and uh, get some tips. Always be polite when you do it. Um, always, when the artist responds to you, get back to them again saying thanks. Yeah. That happens a lot. I'm asked for feedback, and you give it, and then you never hear from them again. That's quite rude, but. You know, just um, push yourself, be passionate about your work, believe in it and keep it lit. That's my advice. Thank you. I hope you have an awesome rest of the day. Brilliant. Nice one. Perfect. Thank you, dude. Thanks a million. Cheers, awesome. Mark. So there it is. There's my interview with me and Matt Griffin, an amazing guy, an inspiration and hearing his advice on how to get into the industry, I think some of the best out there. So I hope that anyone that's listening today who's considering a career as an artist or getting into it as a hobby that wants to take it to that next level is inspired and wants to do what Matt has done because he's become such a successful artist. And as I said at the start of today's episode, his art is so unique, it's incredible, and you really do need to go and check out more of his work on the social media channels. At the moment, guys, things are absolutely hectic with Mark and me, and there's more and more interviews happening every week. It's a great opportunity to jump on board and support the podcast on my Patreon page. There's links on here through markandme.com to access that, and you can sign up for as little as a pound a month, which is absolutely jack shit. And for that, you're getting four episodes minimum a month, I mean, this week you've had three. You're going to get the opportunity to win some incredible artwork from companies like More Art Gallery, Vice Press, T-shirts from Last Exit to Nowhere. Honestly, I'm getting the best prizes out there that I can get right now. And even the guests themselves are donating prizes. It's a great opportunity to support the podcast. All the money from Patreon goes right back into the podcast. It allows me to go out there and do more and more interviews, which means more and more podcasts for you guys at home. So it's a real win-win situation. And as I just said, I've got some incredible prizes. The great guys at More Art Gallery have come along and they've offered the opportunity to win the War of the Worlds prints. And these are incredible. Some of Matt's best work. Matt himself has donated his I think iconic alien artwork. It's absolutely stunning. It's one that I want myself framed in my house because honestly the design is just so good. There's so many designs that are quite similar of alien. I think this one's completely different. It seems very original and yeah, I I, I might fix it that I can win that one. It's it's bloody gorgeous. And again, the great guys, the amazing guys at Vice Press. They've given us the silent running post that Matt's done and there's two different types of these and we're going to be giving both of those away. So the best way to enter these competitions is to go on markandme.com. On there there's links to my Facebook page, my Twitter page, my Instagram and my email. 
There'll be details over the next few days on all of those on how to win these amazing prizes. It's the biggest single giveaway I've done on one episode, and I want to thank all those people for donating these incredible prizes. A massive thank you again to More Art Gallery, Vice Press, and obviously Matt himself. I'll be back again with a brand new episode in only a few days' time. It really is full on at the moment, and there's such a range of different guests. So as always, thanks for listening, take care, and I'll speak to you all soon.